Right now, it is time to bring in Tim Luke and Greg Strom, the appraisal guys of Frick and Frack. You can find them on the web at tqag.com. And you can find them here most uh, every uh, Tuesday, uh, especially except when Greg promises you won't oversleep and forget. Uh, and the next week you call, he oversleeps and forgets. Good morning, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Greg, what happened? You promised, you promised you'd set the alarm. I know. I did set the alarm, but I must have I must have turned it off when it went off and I just fell back asleep. I, I mean, okay. It's the story of my life. <laughs> it is. Uh, speaking of technology, I do have a question for you. All right. Uh, every time you call us, call me anyway on Skype, instead of connecting, it I hear the little boom boom that shows that that it was disconnected. So when I look on Skype, I have to click join call. So it doesn't somehow I I don't know if it's a setting or, or what. So. I'll, I'll look at it. It might be the fact that at the same time, because it's ringing the other one, uh, it, maybe it, it just waits. I I don't know. I'll, I'll look into see if there's any settings on this side where I can that I could work with it. But we we don't know what Skype is. We don't know. Who, you, know you, you it is what it is. We don't even know who's listening. That is what, <laughs> we don't even know who runs the, the damn company. It's part of exactly. Microsoft now. So so right. we'll we'll. we'll look. We'll look into it, okay? It's in the matrix. Uh, there you go. That's it. It's one of those unexplainable things in life. All right. Well, uh, let's take a look. Uh, you know, I, I, this shocked me when I saw this, but it, I guess it shouldn't shock me. Christie's reports uh, an income of $7.1 billion this last year. Yeah. Now, Tim, uh, speaking to that, uh, is, is that like in the top two or three or the top? I mean, it, that seems like uh, to beat that, you'd really, you, you really have to be some power. $7.1 billion. $7.1 billion. It's amazing. And, yes, that's probably right there. Um, Sotheby's is probably right near or just under. I mean, the two were really, really uh, doing great sales this past year. And basically, in talking to a lot of our friends in the auction business, if you didn't have your best year ever, you're doing something wrong because there was such a jump in not only the number of people that were participating, but the more people that you bring in and, and have participate, then that helps drive up prices. But it's also the strategy of the type of material that you are also selling. So it's, you know, it's... We're at a very good place in the marketplace is that there's 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 great stuff out there. And for certain items, there's a lot of desirability and a lot of action in certain markets. And that doesn't go all across the board. Unfortunately, it's not for every area, but it's where you focus. And I think that auction houses, instead of tr focusing on the traditional, oh, we always have to do a sale in this. Well, if that's a downwards trending market well what can we do to change that or in some way uh remarket it or rebrand it or you know just do combined lots so i think auction houses are responding faster to the market trends and things that are happening within the marketplace you know it's it's you know it's um and that's seven point one billion dollars. I mean, it takes a lot. I must take a ton of money to run, of to run the company. So I want. I don't want people to think that that seven point one billion dollars is clear, free and clear. It's not. But I no, think. But, but part of that goes to the consigners as well. Yeah. So I mean, Christie's may only makes a you know a, a percentage of that. So it's not that full amount. But that that's what they conducted in business and you know in their auctions. It, it it truly is amazing, and it shows that um, I, really the pandemic had had virtually no effect this past year. Well, it did have an effect. It helped rise. Well, I mean, a the, yeah, that's right. Uh, that's negative. negative effect. That's right. It didn't have a negative effect. effect. Absolutely, and I think that's what everybody was thinking: is that this was going to be such a doom and gloom. The thing is, is that uh, there was no real supply chain issue with the auction items. They're already there. So in and they're unique items, and it's it's something that if you did want, 
the only thing that was holding it back was maybe if it, there were some delays in shipping or something like that. But other than that, it wasn't like a supply chain issue. It was, wow, okay, let, let's get something that's that's more uh, one of a kind or what, a piece that is unique that I could either add to a collection or gift to someone who has a collection. You know, the other thing to think about this past year is, um, all, you know, for the for most part, um, auction houses are way up as far as what their their annual income has been and the success uh, that they've had. But one of the things that's also happened this year, a lot of auction houses have broken records with uh, some of the certain stuff that items. they have yeah. sold, certain items, and yeah. um, who, you know, it's it's just one of the uh, Let's just say it's probably a for the company. It's a pleasant side effect of what's happened over the pla the past year, but there have been some am amazing um, uh, records broken this year in a lot of the not just the upper tier auction houses, but the mid level and um, the uh, uh, lower level uh, auction houses. Um, I mean, if you look what has sold in even just decorative arts some of these things um have just broken all kinds of records and um i it's a it's a good thing for the market it makes the bottom line look good <laughs> but um uh, w how long will that sustain because you know as we start coming out of this what what how, how is this going to, you know what's going to affect the market next year it'll be interesting uh next year to to follow the the trend and see see how how it's uh if it's maintaining or if it's going up or um and part of it has to do i think also with um the um, world you know the uh, the media worldwide like the the web and all of the uh, social media things, because for example, we watched last night, and I'm th sure Tim's going to talk about this in a second. But we watched. Uh, 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 Sorry, did you say that again? Oh, Siri. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Seriously? I didn't even invite her to join this conversation. I don't know what the hell she thinks she's doing here. <laughs> that was the but lost in any case, the lost Leonardo yeah, documentary. we, we there are watched two the lost Leonardo about the Salvatore Mundi painting that that uh, originally sold, I think, for like eleven hundred dollars, and it finally ended up selling after three or four sales for four hundred million dollars before the buyer's premium. Right, 450. 450 million. So, uh, and, and I think a lot of people have uh, followed that, and I think it's piqued their interest in online auction and uh, not being afraid to uh, bid on um, certain certain assets uh, at a high level. So, uh, it's been a, it's certainly been a good year. I uh, I will say that. Well, Tim, uh, what are, what are, what are your thoughts? I I just I, I think now that it's on a roll, it's on a roll. I mean, uh, people are spending money. I I agree, and I think that they are buying with confidence. And then again, it goes to that supply chain issue: is that there's it's readily available, and I think that's what people are going to be looking at is how easy it is and the accessibility to more of these items in the marketplace because prior to having it so accessible in an app or on your phone is you would have to drive around the country or the world and fly around the world and try to attend all of these different auctions and that would be extremely cost prohibitive so if instead of spending that money for uh airfare and hotels and all your travel is you have it in your hand and the convenience of wherever you are you can you can view 10 15 different auctions within the same day and you can take a look at everything and it can be curated to your particular collecting interests so you set it up to be notified when certain things have certain keywords and that way you don't even it even lessens the time that you have to search it shows you only the things that you're interested in so it's i think that 
the more that, that this grows with technology and the ease of not only purchasing, but also viewing and finding these things, more and more people will come to this. I mean, look at Carvana, look at all these other apps for uh, the things. The, the big thing, if you listen to the ads, they say what they're selling is ease and that this is simple. Uh, and that's that's where that all comes in. And I think that that will really just continue as time goes on. And I think that we'll get more and more people into the fray that will be bidding and they're going to be upgrading their collections and then also looking to sell their collections. All right. Well, uh, by the way, this, of course, is Tim Luke and Greg Strom, the appraisal guys, as they're getting set for uh, Christmas and the holiday season. So an interesting article. Uh, and. And this is, I, I get, to me, I look for the bizarre and the different. Uh, an artist who was born without arms and legs and painted in the Victorian area, uh, Sarah Biffin. Uh, last year, uh, her auction price, I guess, was set at something like $3,400. Well, even that has changed. Uh, well, she's had paintings now uh, bid on uh, for 9,000 uh, pounds, which is about $12,000. Uh, and uh, see now, this is where obviously personal taste comes in. I look, I look at the paintings, and yes, they're amazing, painted by somebody who painted you know, basically with a brush on their mouth. Uh, but uh, have you heard of this artist or, or anything like that? No, I have not. Uh, I, I have not. I just Googled it, and that they're they're. Miss Biffin, miniature painter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Sarah Biffin, and uh, that is oh, and she's done a number of, of self portraits, and uh, she was born in in seventeen eighty four, and uh, so she was a painter in England. No, I have not. Uh, well, on top of that, think of the time period, being a woman, being an artist, right. and also not having um, arms or legs. I, I, I mean, that's uh, holy, holy smoke. I mean, to even be recognized for something like uh, being uh, a good artist with those three things there at that time... I, I can't even imagine what the odds are that she, that uh, she would have been successful. But you, you well, know, I mean, part of part of what made her successful is that she also had a, um, a lot of sponsorship and guidance. Uh, it's it's as in 1908, George Douglas, the Earl of Morton, wanted to see if if Biffin could really paint unaided. And once he was convinced, he sponsored her to receive lessons from the Royal Academy of Arts. So, you know, she she went there. The Society of Arts awarded her a medal in 1821 for her for her historical miniature of the of the Royal Academy. And, I mean, and so her paintings have been recognized uh, for her, mer you know, I mean, her talent, obviously. So there's there's a lot goes into that and was this an article that you read uh marshall just saying that her values are going up or that there's more of a yeah, no they've gone up uh, you know last year getting about three thousand to thirty six hundred dollars of painting and this year uh like i said uh uh nine thousand pounds which of course i think it equates wow. to twelve thousand dollars this year right so right. I mean three thousand. I mean we're not talking substantial, but still three thousand to no. twelve thousand. <laughs> That's a jump, yes. right? Well, so if you had some of these, just thinking, oh, okay. And I think that's what we're seeing in different markets, and not all markets, but in in certain artists, I think people are finding more interest in the historical background, and also, you know, there's a limited quantity that is out there for these items, so. Uh, she has an interesting story and a very interesting uh, uh, background. <laughs> Apparently, also, Charles Dickens mentions her in Nicholas Nickleby and in a couple of other uh, things that he has written. So she's, uh, you know, one of those. Uh, she's one got, of those she's got provenance. They, she's got provenance. <laughs> she's, she does. She's got historical <laughs> referencing. That's fabulous. <laughs> Now, this has probably been broken, but I remember we talked about this so back in the summertime. 
Um, and I think I don't think it's been topped yet. Uh, but the Legend of Zelda game uh, sold for eight hundred and seventy thousand dollars. It was uh, 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 in a packaged, unsealed, and at the time, it's it's the largest most expensive video game ever sold, eight hundred and seventy thousand dollars. That was on my list to talk about because that happened in July of this year. Yeah, July uh, July eleventh, actually. I, that um, has not been topped. <laughs> now, uh, and here's what goes. It, it, the story goes on to say once again because I saved this because I thought it was an interesting story. It includes a 20% buyer's fee. Uh, it topped the $660,000 of a Super Mario Brothers game. Uh, right. But you, you buy. Obviously, these things go right into a hermetically sealed container, and hopefully, in another five years, have doubled or It'd tripled in price. Be a million or 1.2, yes. And this this particular game was also graded, so it is sealed and it has been graded. And I do believe that it was graded at like a nine, nine point nine point oh. So it was probably hardly ever played with. And whoever found it, purchased it, or whoever had it when they were going to sell it, I'm sure that the grading and the sealing of these types of collectibles. Uh, really make a difference but uh, i always think well okay this is so what do you do put a stack of these around your you know <laughs> around the rim of, of <laughs> on, on a shelf no this uh, to me okay. this is like buying a bitcoin uh, you, you buy it you put it right. away and three years so you say okay let me see what this is worth yeah and see because you don't you can't do anything with it except yeah. i mean you could display it it's in a case that's fine but that's about it because yeah. you can't play it you, you don't have a game uh, but that that would be the million dollar idea is to have something that you could, <laughs> but you can't take the thing you can't take it out of there. So yeah, I don't know. And starting off yeah, the video, starting off the new video, year. Go on. Oops, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, go on. Well, the, the the whole thing about the video games is, um, uh, I I. I'm not a. I've never been a video game fan, and it, it just mystifies me how these things. Uh, you know, we we joke about it all the time with Pokemon. Well, you know, Pokemon is having a major resurgence right now, especially in the auction industry, because th there are Pokemon things that are breaking their own records. Um, so it, it's one area that I am not really. Um, familiar with because i don't know these games i don't know the uh, the only one that i know in is because it's tim's favorite game is miss pac-man miss <laughs> pac-man yeah well, I, I, right. I, I will say that super mario holds the record for the most valuable uh vi video game cartridge there was a 36 year old sealed copy of the super mario brothers game that sold for $2 million on a collectible site called Rally, breaking the record for the most expensive video <laughs> game ever sold. And that was in August of this year, August of 2021. So it's um, it, it, that, that, that Zelda has, has the, you know, it, uh, all, all, all things seem to point to that's the next, you know, million dollar. It was thirty six years old. Thirty six years old. It was sold probably. Old, yeah, it was sold probably by its original owner, who's still living in his mother's basement. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> and as we're talking about money, finally, uh, January fifth through seventh in the sunny Orlando area, there's a currency signature auction going on by Heritage Auctions. Uh, when they say signature auction, is it the signature uh, because the person who signed the bills and the the, the notes uh, is is that the signature they're looking for? Well, no. So it could be documents and letters. Uh, I, as, so if they're doing they're doing currency and probably also historic signatures that are either the people who are the signatures on some of the currency or usually presidents or something else. So. It's uh, they usually like to sell those alongside of some of the currencies, and they're kind of like I I guess they also sell auction notes and things like that, which uh, correct, yeah, which which can be pretty impressive. Uh, I had uh, uh, my grandmother's sister, uh, her husband, 
many, 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 many years ago, uh, worked at Standard Oil, all right? And when he passed away, he left basically a suitcase full of stocks. Uh, she passed away, and her family after that uh, had a suitcase worth of stocks that were worth just an unbelievable amount of money unbelievable amount of money not that they you know redeemable i'm talking about collectors collectors and some redeemed in it's huh. yes you know i i, I guess this is you know i people will pay anything for something that they really want that that hits an interest they have oh well, yeah speak speaking of heritage uh and coins and and, and money um they have an auction coming up in January that is should be interesting to watch. It's uh, it's all of the lots in there are coins and currency that have errors on them. So, but they ended up in circulation at some point. So um, uh, that that's going to be interesting to see how that does because um, the the number of lots that they have. Um, it's, uh, it's close to 600 lots of just, uh, currency that has errors of printing, you know, like, uh, uh, mint errors on them. Uh, everything from, uh, a misshaped coin to an underweight coin to, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the image is struck wrong or you know, so that, that, that's always fun because, you know, there was a time when. We talked about this where one of these coins came up for auction and it sold for a tremendous amount of money. Um, so this will be interesting to have close to 600 lots of um, misstruck uh, currency to see to see what the sale does. Because right now they're, the bidding's already started and things are selling or are already at, at some you know, pretty good levels. So it's going to be interesting to see. Um, and this this sale is starts on January the third, and it should be uh, should be fun to follow. So now you guys are all set and settled in for for Christmas. Do you have your New Year's plans now set up? Uh, well, it's kind of not up to us right now. <laughs> it's going to be up to what happens with. Our favorite subject this past year and a half. <laughs> That's right. You know, this, so, this this whole COVID thing, I'm beginning to think that it's going to boil down to be exactly like the the flu. And we're going to be living with COVID the rest of our lives. And uh, people that want to get shots are going to get shots. And people that don't get shots don't get shots. I really, at this point, I shrug. And that's what I, you know, I think it is. Because obviously this thing doesn't want to die. And it doesn't want to kill any more people. Because if it does... It's not going to be able to, you know, keep reinventing itself. So, yeah, and I'm, it won't be newsworthy. It, well, so <laughs> you know, I, my meteorologist came up with a great idea. Instead of telling us how many people get it each day, report it like the common cold. You know, here's how many hospitalizations we have, and here's how many deaths we have. That's all we need to know, uh, because I think we're going to be living with this for the rest of our lives. And uh, Yeah, I think so. I think so. Well, well, we came up with a very novel idea because, you know, uh, uh, I decided, or Tim and I decided that we, we didn't want to spend a second Christmas without family. So we decided that... We're going to turn it. We're got lemonade out of lemons. So we purchased the uh, instant test kit. Okay. And before everybody can come in the house, they get an instant test. And while they're waiting for the results at 15 minutes, they'll be in a socially distanced area where they can have as much champagne as they can pound down in 15 minutes. And the great the thing results. about that is, if the test comes out positive. They've got enough champagne in them. They won't give a damn. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, well, so far also, the results. Yeah, the 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 uh, response from the, you know, the the people. Uh, it's it's only ten people, so it's right. not as though it's a Small tremendous numbers, amount. All, they all second. thought it was a great idea, and I, I kind of, yeah. uh, well, I I second. have to thank Tim for that because I I was a little hesitant to send out an email like that, but. Everybody no. thought it was a great idea. 
Good. So. Well, and also in our invite, we just said that please be sure to make sure that you are boosted and have your vaccines. And, you know, it's a small number of people, but we just said we just want right. to ensure, you know, out of a, an abundance of caution, make sure that everyone is, you know, feeling because it's both mentally and physically, because mentally you're just wondering, oh, my gosh, I'm with some people is this and you get this. It's very, you know, it's d difficult, but we were, you know, we're no hugging, no kissing, stay a little do distant and we'll enjoy uh, the holidays. So my uh, brother is in town from Ohio and my sister and her husband are driving down uh, tomorrow uh, from North Carolina. So. We'll have them and just a few of our friends that we know also uh, mask up and, you know, don't go to big crowds and do things it's like basically that. basically I mean, our bubble. It's it's yeah. our bubble, basically, still. I well, mean, I'm, I'm the worst. I mean, I, I'm the one that would be the intruder, <laughs> but I always... Right. I mean, I'm traveling all over, but I'm in small groups. I make sure that we don't, if we eat, we're, we eat outside or we take it back to our hotel room. I mean, you know, we're very vigilant with the hand sanitizer and the masks and just making sure that we um, are doing every. You know, I want to make sure because I don't want to bring it home to oh. Greg or to my mom and dad. All right. Well, I want to wish you guys a, a Merry Christmas. Jill and I wish, wish you a Merry Christmas. Have an enjoyable time and we'll speak to you oh. next week. Hey, okay. right back at you, and Merry happy Christmas. 35th for the yeah. radio station. 35 years. That's outstanding. Years. That comes up on yeah, December 23rd. Arthur will be on the air for 35 years on the AM. Outstanding. When did you start? Were you 12 years old? Well, I've been on the air. This is my 51st year, so. <laughs> we, we, yeah. <laughs> I remember I worked at a radio station in Kingston, New York, and uh, they they were celebrating 35 years, 35 years in your ears. And I remember working back there and saying, Jesus, that's a long time. <laughs> well, guess right. what? Right. It's not. I've been doing it for 51. <laughs> it's, it's funny what age does. Gives you context and perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas, hey, guys. Hey, Thank Merry you. Christmas. Take care. Thank you. Uh, Tim Luke and Greg Strom, the appraisal guys, the frickin' frack of Nick and Knack, with the praise this here on Robin Hood Radio.